Entertainment, a kind of happy song and dance man, a crowd pleasing minstrel in whiteface. But when he wiped away the grease paint, we were left with a serious actor of transcendent talent whose compelling performances in and out of the ring were the stuff of high sports and political theater. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Cassius Marcellus Clay. He's young, he's handsome, they know it. He's a poet, a prophet, and many people believe he'll be the next heavyweight champion of the world. He was essentially seen as a trash-talking buffoon. Every picture that you saw of him, he had his mouth wide open and was looking all crazy and out of control. I'm handsome, I'm fast, I'm pretty, and can't possibly be beat. He was a fighter, fine, but he was a performer. He was an artist. He knew not only whether he was losing the fight or winning the fight, but he knew when he was losing the crown. He put on a show before the fight. He put on a show during it, and after it, he was even better. He changed the way athletes acted with the media and the way the media treated athletes. Well, my goodness, you'd ask Muhammad Ali any of these questions, and he'd soar off into uh, great flights of either poetry or bombast. I mean, he never knew it was going to come out of the man's mouth. I'm the greatest. I'm knocking out all bones. And if you get too smart, I'll knock you out. On one hand, he might say at different times, I'm Wyatt Earp, I'm Bat Masterson, I'm Moses. And then sometimes later when somebody would say, oh, you're Moses, you're Jesus, you're the greatest, he was like, nah, I'm just another nigger trying to get bigger. Ali's hair-triggered candor often threw fresh light into corners of his life not recorded by the cameras. Muhammad Ali wouldn't have a thing to do with women when he was a young fighter. Boy, when he discovered them, Wow, did he make up for lost time. Chris Dundee told me one time that he handled 30 in one day. 30. The night before they fought Joe Bugner, there was a woman in every room on his floor. And he's going from one room to the next. What do you think is wrong with you? What is wrong? What are your faults? Well, I have a lot of faults. Like what? What's the word? I can't tell you my worst fault because I'm married. Unbeaten in 19 fights and still known as Cassius Clay, his focus wasn't on women as he trained in Miami Beach in the winter of 1964 for his first title shot. Virtually no one thought that Cassius Clay had a chance to beat Sonny Liston. Certainly Sonny Liston did. Sonny Liston was one of the scariest presences on the sporting scene ever. This was a guy who had been arrested probably a hundred times. He was a strong arm man for the mob. I know a lot of guys that completely collapsed when they used to see the guy. I saw Liston knock a guy's teeth out with a jab. He was your worst dreams. He was a guy when you owe your bookie and you didn't pay, they sent Sonny Liston after you. He was Dr. Death. That was a picture of Clay on the cover of Time magazine. Liston dropped the magazine to the ground, looked at it, and broad daylight pulled out his penis and just urinated on it. <laughs> Clay countered with his own brand of outrageous bravado. I see that bear on the street. I beat him before the fight. You'd actually take him on before the fight? Beat him like I'm his daddy. When he's getting ready to fight, he drives his bus onto the front lawn at Liston's house in Denver. Come on out here and fight. I'll fight you now, you big ugly bear. Now it's a show. That's a sham. That's a publicity man's dream. Screaming, hollering, yelling, now I got you, big bear. Where are you going to go hide? And the more he ran it, the more he ran, the, the more it became apparent to the big bear that this guy was crazy. While Sonny simmered, 
Clay often turned his training sessions into the stuff of high comedy, drawing a who's who in the entertainment world. The five of us were in this dressing room waiting for Muhammad Ali, and suddenly the door bursts open, and he gathers up all the Beatles, and he says, okay, Beatles, stick with me, and you'll make some money. It was just a magic moment, the Beatles, Cassius Clay, you know, this new era in America. And then afterwards, as they're leaving, he turned to me and he said, who were those little faggots? But behind the rough humor, Clay was engaged in private consultation with black Muslim leader Malcolm X. A veiled metamorphosis was underway. The butterfly called Cassius was changing his colors. Meanwhile, the show went on. Liston arrives here in Miami. Muhammad find out when the plane arrives. Chase them with a cane. Come here, bear. I'll get you, bear. At the weigh-in, Oh, he went berserk. He was thumping his cane on the ground and wandering around and shouting and screaming. And we all thought it was fear, because the classic defense uh, against fear is noise. A lot of serious writers thought that Ali was so terrified and in such a panic that he didn't know what to do except to scream, yell, chant, maybe hope that they would not allow him to go on that night. And Sonny Liston's eyes widened. Because nobody knows it then, but the only thing Sonny Liston was afraid of was a crazy person. And then his blood pressure went up to 200 over 180 or something like that. Well, it's absolute proof that he's crazy. And all that was sham. It's back in the limousine and he's got perfectly normal blood pressure. And did have all afternoon. That night of February 25th, 1964, Clay's moment of truth. When he stepped into the rain, it was so much bigger than Liston. I mean, we hadn't figured it out. Liston wanted to give the image of being invincible to the point of stuffing towels under his robe. My guy was bigger. At 6'3 and 210 pounds, Clay was also younger, faster, and sharper. The challenger is jabbing all over body. Aiden, look at it. The best punch of the fight so far. This 8-1 underdog was out running him, out gutting him, and shaming him. Kid is moving, 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 popping a jab, but every once in a while he stops and throws a right hand that rips up cuts under this guy. Liston had the mentality of a bully, and when someone stood up to him and was outwitting him and out hitting him, he just completely fell apart. So now some magical moment that was similar to something that had happened in a couple other Liston fights. The eyes of Cassius Clay start burning. Liston put an astringent on his gloves or shoulders or in some way that rubbed into Clay's eyes and people thought Ali was quitting when in fact he just couldn't see. When he came back and he says, cut the gloves off, I said, sit down, it's a title. You get him down and I put the water in his eyes, I'm wiping him clean. Now some of the black Muslims at ringside start storming the corner because they think that the white devil, meaning Angelo, is putting something in rather than trying to find out what it is that he's got in his eyes. Angelo's life was at stake. If he'd had to stop the fight and that would have been it, Angelo would have been in for a big beating, at least, if not death. Oh, about those guys? Forget about it. I would have took a shot at one of those guys that came at me. But he said, you can't, can't see, I can't see, I said... Muhammad, run! They're yelling from Cassius Clay's corner. Something got in his right eye. He's blinking terribly. I knew Muhammad had him when the guy couldn't do nothing with him. He's teeing off on him with his best shots. Halfway through the round, kid reacts, gone. Liston had no shot. When Liston didn't answer the bell for the seventh round, Clay, at 22, was king of the world. You don't give up the heavyweight championship of the world, the single most valuable prize in all of sports, because your shoulder hurts. He quit. I took up the world! 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 The next morning, Clay split America in two, following Malcolm X by confirming his membership in the Nation of Islam. Malcolm X was a magnetic personality. Malcolm X had welcomed him in. He's an Orthodox Muslim who prays five times a day, who reads scripture, 
who reads the Quran, and it was the beginning of the confusion about him. Elijah Muhammad gave him the name of Muhammad Ali. He was probably one of the most hated men in America. He joined a cult that had been presented to most white Americans as racist, a hate group. These guys look very sinister with their bow ties and their grim faces and calling white people devils. Well, this just seemed nuts to people. I mean, this just seemed absolutely crazy. All of a sudden, the heavyweight champion of the world is preaching what most people think of as a doctrine of hate. Muhammad Ali actually said that any black man involved with any white woman should be killed. And somebody said to him, well, that sounds like the lynchings in the South. He said, right. People were repelled, uh, shocked. He went from being that witty, great, likable young guy, Cassius Clay, to being something that they simply couldn't cope with. But then there was the split between Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X. Now Muhammad Ali had to choose between the two, and he chose the leader of the sect. In a way, he had no real choice. Malcolm X was the outcast. Ali was, I think, scared, too. He's a very young guy. He's 23 years old. Does this split disturb you that has been reported? No, what Malcolm X does is his business. He's one man. Your leader is Elijah Muhammad. Yes, sir. You could say that he betrayed Malcolm X, put all his faith and marbles in Elijah Muhammad. Ali was no fool. Ali knew very well that uh, the, the, the nation had ways of dealing with its enemies. Malcolm X had crossed the line. He had gotten into a dispute with Elijah Muhammad. You don't do that. Malcolm X was under death threats. Malcolm X was killed by the nation of Islam. This was serious business. Hardened by the reception much of America gave to his new name and religion, Ali proceeded to establish his new identity in the ring, where infidels were publicly punished. He did it with Floyd Patterson and Ernie Terrell, both of whom refused to call him Muhammad Ali. They insisted on calling him Cassius Clay, and he just humiliated them and brutalized them in the ring. It was not a pretty thing to watch. He says, why do you call me Clay and everybody else call me Muhammad Ali? You just an old Uncle Tom. He popped Patterson with a jab and would say, what's my name? Pow! What's my name? Pow! And then he refused to knock him out so he could beat him up more. He wanted to beat them up bad. Muhammad Ali is one of the great self-created characters in American history. And I think you have to recognize that some things that you might not like were part of that self-creation. To cast Muhammad Ali as a plaster saint is really absurd and doesn't give the true texture of the story. Signs. When he wasn't painting signs, Cassius Clay Sr. often cruised Louisville's black saloons with an eye out for diversion. Muhammad Ali's dad was this chesty, outgoing, 
alcoholic, spent most of his married life chasing women. He was a drunk, uh, and he was a mean drunk. He was arrested a lot of times for disorderly assault. One night, the police were called there. The father, Cassius, was gone, and Muhammad Ali had a slash in his thigh, obviously from a knife or a razor or something like that. And I talked to the policeman who rolled out to the scene, and he said they didn't want to prosecute. They didn't even want to tell me who did it. He said I was pretty sure that Cassius Sr. did it. There were some heavy-duty scenes in that house. Part of what lay beneath his father's erratic behavior was an anger as old as slavery. The interesting thing about his name, Cassius Clay, is that it comes from a slave owner, but a slave owner who freed the slaves on his plantation and became an abolitionist politician. So in fact, the family had great pride in this name. Despite the historical honor of the family name, Clay suffered scholastically, finishing high school 376 out of 391 students. He fared no better on the social front. He wasn't shy, but you knew that he was not, as we used to say, a player. Muhammad had a crush on one of my classmates, and the story has it that he walked her home, and after he walked her home one night, she kissed him on the cheek, and they say he fainted. Clay came of age when something important was taken from him. Cassius Clay, 12 years old, had his bicycle stolen, a beautiful red Schwinn, and he was angry, very angry. And he started yelling and screaming how he was going to whoop the next kid he saw that had a red Schwinn and it might be his and da-da-da-da-da. And he wandered into a boxing gym. Cash is coming, rocketing down the stairs. Somebody stole my bike and I'm going to kill him when I get him. I'm going to fight him. And Joe Martin said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You want to fight? Yeah, I want to fight. And Joe Martin took him under his wing. That was it. Six years later in Rome, Clay won the Olympic light heavyweight championship. Radiating a new, fun-loving, fresh-faced persona in 1960, he seduced millions and even pursued the elegant Wilma Rudolph. But upon his arrival back in America, he was instantly recast as a second-class citizen. He was very dissatisfied that, you know, he'd come all the way back home. You couldn't eat at the lunch counters. You couldn't go to the movies. Uh, a lot of places you couldn't even go to the bathroom. And if you did want something to eat, you had to get it to go. Cassius Clay had a gold medal around his neck, and he goes into a luncheonette for a bowl of soup, and he's refused service. And somebody behind the counter says, do you know who that is? He's the hometown boy. He just won a gold medal. He said, I don't care who he is. Get him out of here. Three and a half years later, Ali gained only a measure of respect by beating heavyweight champ Sonny Liston in Miami. But on May 25th, 1965, in Lewiston, Maine, Ali was acknowledged as the rightful champion of the world when he dispatched Liston in the first round. Second time, the cloak of invincibility was taken away from him. He was not the tough guy no more. Muhammad was his master. Muhammad was the guy that was going to kick his butt, and he did it again. While most of the fight community grudgingly accepted Ali as a new kind of champion with size, speed, and agility, a significant few remained skeptical of the ease with which he won the rematch. With Liston's ties to the mob, he was suspected of having taken a dive from a right hand that would come to be known as the Phantom Punch. All this time, Ali's standing over him, and those are the famous photographs where he's saying, get up, you bum, nobody will believe this. Get up and fight. Years later in the Las Vegas casino, I asked Liston, did you go into the tank for that? He said, no, no, no. He said, man, that guy was crazy. He said, I didn't want anything to do with him. There was rumors that the Muslims were coming up and they're going to kill Liston. Who needed that? He said, so I got hit with a little light punch and I went down. I wasn't hit. He said, uh, I just didn't want any part of it. When we return, Ali faces his two toughest opponents, the U.S. government and Joe Frazier. It's probably the greatest risk that he ever took because, you know, the United States don't play with you when you start dealing and things about your country. Joe Frazier became the heavyweight champion of the world. But the heavyweight champion of the world, the real guy, was in confinement for about three years. 
Now, these guys have to prove who the real champ is. Ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. I have today ordered to Vietnam the Air Mobile Division. Additional forces will be needed later, and they will be sent as requested. Mr. Muhammad Ali has just refused to be inducted into the United States Armed Forces. You said you were the people's champion? Yes, sir. Do you think that you're acting like a people's champion? Yes, sir. When he said, I ain't got nothing against them Viet Cong, uh, they ain't never called me nigger. He meant that, and he meant that sincerely. I will not go 10,000 miles to help murder another poor people simply to continue the domination of white slave masters over the darker people of the earth. It is a war that he considers unjust, and his conscience will not allow him to do it. Now, certainly, I would endorse that, I would justify his action, and I would give him my strongest support in his doing it. There is a substantial segment of society that cheered. There was an equally substantial segment that thought that Ali was not only wrong, but engaged in what amounted to treason. I don't think the society had any respect for a draft dodger. I don't think they had any respect for any person who shrunk from his duties as a citizen. This fellow they call Clay or Muhammad Ali, whatever he wants to call himself, is a disgrace to the nation. Maybe this boy has forgotten he's black. Let's, let's remind him who's in charge here. What happens now to his title? He will doubtless be stripped of it by every state boxing commission in this country and by the World Boxing Association. In 1967, after nine title offenses, Ali lost the first round of the biggest fight of his life. But even as his lawyers appealed his conviction, a fundamental shift was taking place in America. Liberals were getting behind Ali. Anti-war protesters were getting behind Ali. He spoke for us. I'm a white, middle-class college kid, and that's exactly how I felt. It was almost as if there was this halo over him and people following willingly. He was the damn Pied Piper. He could be the hero of the anti-war people. He could be the hero of the black nationalist. He was fluid enough to accept the projections of every group's need without contradicting anyone. Ali had defied the patriotic precepts of the country by saying, I'm not going to participate in the war effort. He lost three years of his ability as a boxer. He lost three years of income. But once he had paid the price, even people who disagreed with Ali, even people who thought, this is a big blabbermouth, this guy's a lot of hot air, said, you know what, he paid the price. And any time an American pays the price, other Americans say, that's my man. In 1971, the Supreme Court, in a unanimous decision, overturned Ali's conviction. Howard Cosell had been in Ali's corner throughout his ordeal. When I first put him on boxing, everybody said he doesn't know anything about boxing. Why would you put this guy in boxing? And then he became legendary. Every once in a while, history does us the favor of bringing together two people who separately make magic, but together they make double magic. Here was this loudmouth, brash, outspoken lawyer from Brooklyn who had been a Little League radio commentator. And here was Ali, who was this brash, outspoken, heavyweight champion of the world, whose title had been taken away, who had changed his name. Cosell is the first one to call him Muhammad Ali, tell his story, respect his Muslimism. These two guys who are the object of this intense dislike suddenly become this likable pair. I'm always confident I'm with all of them. You're being extremely truculent. Whatever truculent means, if that's good, I'm that. You can't divorce the two. He knew that this kid at the time was somebody special. 
this was somebody I'm going to cover, and I'm going to cover him hard, and I'm going to cover him over and over again, because he's got something special, and we're both going to go to the top together. I don't think he manipulated him, but whenever he could, he got an interview with him. And I think they both played off each other. They made a lot of news together, and I think they had a lot of fun together. In 1970, Ali's exile ended. And after a pair of tune-up fights, he met 26-0 Joe Frazier in March of the following year in Madison Square Garden. Ali looked at Frazier as the sellout, guy had sold out to the white establishment, become champion when Ali couldn't fight. For Joe Frazier to be a champion, he's got to beat me. He branded Joe Frazier and Uncle Tom in a way that was very cruel. But it wasn't done by accident. It was done to gain a psychological advantage. For him to be viewed as a white, uh, sucking Uncle Tom kind of guy was the greatest insult you could give a guy who was nothing but raging black. That was the setting for the first fight. And it was the most electrifying event that I've ever been at. The anticipation, two undefeated champions, two champions of the first rank, and Ali coming back to reclaim in many people's minds what was rightly his, but not against some patsy, against Joe Frazier. His feelings towards Ali in the ring that night were anything but cordial. I had one focus, the butterfly. Styles make fights, and there never were two more contrasting styles that would work to give you a great fight than Joe Fraser bobbing in left hand at work and Muhammad Ali pinpointing his punches to Fraser's head. Muhammad Ali, flat on his feet, how to fight. The young Muhammad Ali would have run circles around Joe Fraser, but it wasn't the young Ali who got in the ring with Joe. From the layoff, he lost an incredible amount of sharpness. He lost the quickness and the ability to avoid a punch. My kid blew the 11th round big. I don't know how the heck he stayed erect. He looked like a ballet dancer, like a pirouette. In the 15th round, Muhammad Ali went down from a bodacious left hook, his eyes spinning in his head. And he could have stayed there and been counted out, but he didn't. He got up and took some more beating. Muhammad Ali has never taken such a battering. The good news was he learned he could take a punch, and the bad news was he learned he could take a punch. He didn't feel that he was fighting only for himself. He felt that he was fighting for everybody who believed in him. March 8, 71, I cried my eyeballs out. Cried my eyeballs. Not just because he lost, but because he symbolized so much. It wasn't about sports. It was about wars, it was about race, it was about politics, it was about society, it was about generations. And the feeling was that if Ali lost, then, then we were wrong. It was the first Liston fight all over again. George Foreman had knocked out Joe Frazier. I've seen people knocked down, but I, uh, to this day, I've never seen anybody knocked up and then down, like a basketball. And ch this is Joe Frazier. Frazier's knees buckled. He is, about, he is down. He is down for the fourth time in the fight. Ali looked like he was a fading champion who didn't have the speed anymore, who took a lot of punches, and who was about to get back down. My biggest worry is where were we going to take him when he got hurt? Although he had defeated Joe Frazier in their rematch nine months earlier, Ali was no longer as sharp as he had been. But what time had stolen from his body, Ali made up for with a fully developed genius for psyching out an opponent. We were sitting with Jack Dempsey, and George walked in. George starts staring at Ali, and Ali got up. He said, Sonny, listen to this when you're a little bitty boy. You think I'm scared of you? You're nothing. I'll whip your butt right here. And Foreman walked away, and Ali sat down, looked at Jack Dempsey. He said, I just won round one. But round one would have to wait. A cut over Foreman's eye delayed the fight five weeks, allowing the challenger to marshal millions. Muhammad Ali and the people of Zaire entered into a perfect marriage. 
They had a rally to see the two fighters. Ali got out on the running track and started calling to people, and he had found out how to say kill him in their language, which was Boumaye. <laughs> Muhammad got that Ali Boumaye chant going right from the get-go. He was the hero. The other guy was the enemy. George was the enemy. So by fight time, I doubt that there were more than a handful of people in Zaire who weren't rooting for Ali. <laughs> First round, Ali goes out, he goes up on his toe, bang, hits him with that first shot. Now, what does Foreman do? With the gloves, cuts the ring off, Ali goes back on the ropes. The whole time we were there, all we did was had sparring partners pressuring him to the rope so he could spin this way, spin that way. The whole thing was whatever you do, don't stand still. Don't let this guy stand in front of you. He hits George, then he goes back on the ropes. The rope do the rope do Come on, George, you ain't nothing. Show me something. George is throwing punches. Bang, bang, bang. Everybody be saying, get on the ropes, Ali. Get on the ropes, bang. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. We're screaming at him in the corner. And he said, shut up. I know what I'm doing. This guy's not hurting. It was a huge, brilliant gamble. The one that could have backfired on him very easily. I mean, it was just staying on the ropes, being hit. I did hurt this guy a lot. I hurt him more than a lot. But I've never faced anyone with that kind of bravery before. George Foreman got exhausted. He missed a lot of shots. And he was catching arms and everything else. So that's what emptied George Foreman's tank, missing them. I hit him hard in the side. I mean, I got a good shot. And he said, is that all you got, George? And I remember thinking, yep, that's about it. And not more than 20 minutes after the fight was over, the monsoon hit. And it hit really hard. There was flickering of lightning along the horizon. Uh, we all went back in this uh, entourage of cars to uh, the hotels in Kinshasa. And all along the road were uh, the Africans standing in the rain, leaping up and down and shouting, Ali Boumaye, Boumaye, thousands and thousands and thousands. People started coming out, lining the roads, just for a look at the alley motorcade in the hope that maybe he would bless their children. We pull up to Ali's compound, and there is Ali, just a couple of hours after the greatest victory of his life, and he is sitting on the stoop to his bungalow with about five or six little kids, and he's doing some magic tricks with a rope. Less than a year later, Ali arrived in the Philippines to defend his title and settle an old score with his nemesis, Joe Frazier. It will be a killer and a chiller and a thriller when I get the gorilla in Manila. Manila wasn't about the heavyweight championship of the world. There was something much more important at stake. Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier were fighting for the heavyweight championship of each other. They both understood that whoever won this fight, well, that's who history was going to recognize as the greater fighter. Frazier's smiling as Ali talks to him. Really, it was a fight in three parts. The first part, Ali is just whipping on Frazier. I mean, he's tagging him, he's tagging him. Somehow, in the middle rounds, Frazier comes through. Frazier starts wailing, he cuts off the ring, he gets him on the ropes. He was killing Ali. Ali tried to regain the psychological edge by looking at him and saying, Joe Frazier, they told me you were washed up. And Frazier said, they told you wrong, pretty boy. Closest to life and death I've ever seen. To equally match fighters at the top of their form with an intense competitive edge on each other, if not dislike, actual hatred, if you will. It didn't seem that you could survive that. By the 12th round, Ali had regained his edge over Frazier. It was only a question of whether he could last. It looked like Ali was going to have to quit in the corner. 
because he was getting so beat up. He said, I feel like I'm dying. This must be what death feels like. Frazier could not see, and Ali knew what he had to do to win, and he could keep wailing away at will with that jab in his eyes. Though it came back to the corner at the end of the 14th round, and uh, I said, it's all over, Joe. He said, you can't see, and I know it. I said, I can visualize it. Don't worry about it. He said, no. So I said, OK. Shut it down. I think it's going to be over. It's not over. It was a climax to Ali's career. And he collapsed right on the canvas at that point. He had nothing left to give. After that fight, I was up in a suite. And the blood red sun was dropping over Manila Bay. He took my hand and moved it across his forehead, and there was just a ridge of bumps, terrible bumps. And he just said, why I do this? When we return in an ill-advised match, 38-year-old Muhammad Ali is reduced to helplessness against a respectful Larry Holmes. I told the referee at the time, uh, Richard Green, I uh, said, so look, why don't you start the fight? I mean, he can't take you see it's, he's, he's helpless. We want to kill him. The only thing that makes Muhammad Ali like other fighters is the fact that he went on way too long. The people who really cared for him pleaded with him to quit after Manila, and instead he fought five more years. It was hubris, I guess, and he, he just couldn't push himself out of the limelight. said to me, I want to show you something. And he took his shirt off. It was absolutely mind-boggling. He looked exactly the way he looked when he fought Sonny Liston the first time. And I said, that doesn't prove anything, Muhammad. And he said, well, I fooled you then, and I'm going to fool you tomorrow. And I wish he had. This is the guy who beat Frazier. This is the guy who beat Foreman. He's going to do it again. This is incredible. And then they rang the bell. And within a round, you knew it wasn't Ali. Ali has said he doesn't want to go out the way Joe Lewis did, and others have. But you wonder, is Ali just fighting physiological laws that can't be overcome? Two or three days before the fight, after Ali had day after day been talking to the press and, uh, and giving the media his entertaining uh, diatribes, things changed. He was up there one day talking, and the press had already had its fill of it. And pretty soon as he's talking, there's a little buzz in the room. Then a little bit more time would go by, and there was more buzz. And pretty soon nobody was listening to Ali. That was almost as sad as the actual fight when Ali lost so badly and ended the fight almost cowering in fear. His hands are no longer busy. His feet no longer sweat. And Ali is learning that even he cannot be for Young. To watch him just get beaten up without putting up a fight. It's just standing in a corner, just being beaten to a pulp. Brought tears to my eyes. And I remember sitting there at ringside and Holmes shouting to the referee, stop this, stop it, I'm going to hurt him. And then, boom, hitting him. I don't think Ali hit him five times all night. It was the saddest sports event I ever covered. Oh, he's, he's ready to go. This must be stopped. It is a sad way to end. In 1984, Muhammad Ali was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. At 42, the greatest faced a future of diminishing physical ability. 
But over the decades, he soldiered on, displaying a level of grace and simple humanity that all the words and rhymes could not surpass. If you had told somebody in 1968 that in 1996 Muhammad Ali would be the most beloved individual on earth, and the mere sight of him holding an Olympic torch would bring people to tears, you'd won a lot of bets. You'd won a lot of bets. Both on the dais at an awards dinner from the Boxing Writers Association. He took a glass and a felt tip pen and he traced around the glass so he had a circle and then he drew in continents. And then he nudged me and he pointed at it and he said, I used to be champion of all of that. And then in the middle of everybody else's speeches, he fell asleep. He doesn't feel sorry for himself and there's no reason for anybody else to feel sorry for him. He lives a very satisfied life. He does exactly what he wants to do when he wants to do it. God has blessed him many times over and continues to bless him, so there's nothing for him not to be happy about. came to the camp to meet Ali. Ali looked at the boy, why do you wear a skull cap? The boy said, Ali, I got cancer, I have chemo, I lost all my hair. Ali hugged the boy and Ali told the little boy, I'm gonna beat George Foreman and you're gonna beat cancer. Two weeks later, Ali and I went down to see the boy, we heard he was in bad shape. And when we walked in, Ali said, I told you I'm gonna beat George Foreman and you're gonna beat cancer. And the little boy looked Ali in the eyes with his big blue eyes and he said, no champ, I'm going to meet God and I'm going to tell him I know you. After the Holmes fight, Muhammad Ali lost to Trevor Burbick and retired with a 56-5 record. For two decades, Ali used his physical and mental brilliance to shake up the world. Now he's a captive of his own body, unable to move with range, unable to rap with flair. The man who spoke for half the world now rests quietly on a secluded farm in Michigan. For ESPN Classics Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler.